Do you want to know the number one secret to having a crazy successful cold call? Then this episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Sales Man Podcast. On today's show, we have Jordan Stupar. He is the CEO over at Stupar Sales Academy. You can find out more about Jordan over at jordanstupar.com, where you can find his newsletter as well. And on today's episode, we're diving into the secrets of a successful cold call, cold email, just communication in general, and it is the cliche adding value. But in this episode, Jordan is explaining practical ways that we can add value on the phone, in person, in meetings and after meetings. And there's just a whole lot to go at in this one. We go deep. And so with all that said, let's jump in to today's episode. Jordan, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Hey, great to, great to be here. I'm glad to have you on. I'm glad to dive into today's topic of comparing, perhaps it's almost old school versus new school. And I hate this cliche way of describing things, but always be adding value or always bring value versus the always be closing, which is what I guess all my sales managers have, have kind of drilled into me over the years in medical devices, because that's what they grew up hearing drilled into them by their sales managers. But I want to start off by hopefully quashing a bit of a misconception here, Jordan, of whether it's a cold call, cold email, outreach, networking event, whatever it is. Is it possible to always bring value in that first interaction with an individual that clearly you want to have a sales conversation with later? Or is that first interaction, is that solely useful for sucking a bit of value and then arranging an appointment time to potentially add value in the future? Yeah. So I think when you're reaching out to somebody, um, the, the, the biggest goal that you can have on a cold call, on a cold email, even if you know, you're know you sliding into somebody's uh, DM on Instagram, any way that you're reaching out to somebody, the, your only goal and intention should be to generate interest. Because if you fail to generate interest, you're going to fail to have an appointment or or get a deal because just there's no interest there. So um, the way to really generate interest is to figure out in using like little micro questions and, and you know, these value driven questions is to figure out where somebody might have a problem. I'm not going to be uh, I'm not going to tell anybody that they do have a problem and I'm the guy that can solve it. But I do want to find out if somebody might have a problem. Um, because that lays out the foundation for the rest of the communication and allows me to provide value. Um, I want to be able to provide value initially so that somebody can be interested in me, my product, my service, and my company. I want to, I want to ask you about value driven questions. We'll get some examples and we'll go through that in a second, but you just brought something up almost nonchalantly, which is really interesting. And I've had success with it recently. And that is quote unquote sliding into people's DMS. I've been trying to get in contact with this. Um, who to describe is he's, he's, he's in the C-suite of a fortune 500 company He's a big shot. Of course, his email isn't public. He's got a probably multiple a receptionist and an assistant managing his email anyway. So it's very likely that I'm going to get lost in there. He's on Instagram. I DM'd him two seconds later, he DM me back and we're having a phone call in, um, a couple of weeks time. That's just how busy is his schedule. He genuinely was apologizing that he couldn't get in contact quicker. He went through, and this is what was interesting to me. It's almost similar to getting in contact with someone on LinkedIn and they immediately check your LinkedIn profile. His message back was, I've just been through your Instagram profile. I love all the content. I love the guests that you're doing. I love your message. And I'm, I'm having a, I want to have an, an advertising uh, sponsorship conversation with him later down the line. But immediately, I'm in his good books. I've broken through the barrier of entry. I sent him a useful insight about his company, which he probably already knew, but it showed that I made a, somewhat of an effort for it. He checked out my profile so he knows what we're all about. He's seen the previous guests. And so that first conversation I'm going to have with him now, there's no, well, like we do X, Y, Z and trying to, I feel like when you are having to explain the basics like that, you're sucking value from the conversation. Um, but you just mentioned it really nonchalantly. We've never covered DMs on Instagram before on the show. And so, you know, props to you for, for mentioning it. But is that something that you've experimented with as well? You know, I think Instagram is a part of the future and it's definitely part of the, the present right now. And it, and it's a great way to reach out to people. Um, even even those high authority figures, those those people that are high in the ranks of, of different corporate ladders, they if they have an Instagram, they, they, they have a message, you know, and, and there's a there's a way that you can use hashtags and you can search out people's profiles and you can find out pretty quickly, you know, whether somebody has a problem that you can solve or, uh, you know, some type of interest in, in a product or service that you sell. And it almost goes that step further. And maybe this is 
maybe this is key to the overall conversation of always bringing value. So I went on your Instagram, clearly I saw the Porsches, and that was how I led the conversation to build that little bit of rapport before we click record. Get the audience know I'm, I, I'm into Porsches and, and German sports cars in general. But that was that was from your Instagram profile. I could see the the 911 on there. And well, the first thing that intrigued me was that I've never seen the dash before. And there's like five clusters, like circular clusters. And I was like, that's not a cheap Porsche right there. So I knew you clearly you have a passion for them to to be involved at that level. And I think this is almost a missed opportunity that B2B salespeople don't take advantage of. If someone puts a Porsche on their Instagram profile, they're clearly proud of it. They want to be talked about. And that's something that we should be engaging with them, right? Is is that how we should be leading these conversations? Uh, not getting creepy and talking about, um, you know, there's a picture of the two daughters at a baseball game. Maybe we don't bring that up, but for blokes, cars, um, you know, for for women, if they've gone on, I'm, I'm being massively sexist here. I can feel myself going down a, a, a rabbit hole or digging a ditch, but for women, it could be holidays, whatever it is that people are passionate about. Is that what we should be leading cold emails and cold conversations with? You definitely can. Um, I, I think that it's a, a, a bigger mistake when you do have a set appointment or a set meeting um, with the decision maker and you're about to do your pitch. I think it can be a bit, bit of a mistake to, you know, want to do the whole rapport thing and talk about something. Um, because it just kind of devalues the time of why you're actually there to pitch the deal or whatever. But in that initial outreach, um, mentioning to somebody that, hey, I uh, noticed you have you know, the new Porsche or I noticed that uh, you just bought a, a condo on the water in this part of town. Like, that's really cool. Um, it's so easy these days to break the ice um, because there's so many people that just do it incorrectly. Hey, are you interested in uh, health insurance? Hey, are you interested in life insurance? Um you know, and, and, and I'm sure you get it, too, where people reach out to you and they're like, hey, uh, I've got this great product. Uh, you know, do you want it? <laughs> when when you know, my whole life is located online, like most people's are, and you can, it doesn't take very long for you to figure out what I'm really interested in and what I completely have no interest in. Um, so it's just it. You know, I think it's a big mistake by salespeople not to vet out um, their, their leads and their contacts on social to find out at least a little bit about who they're reaching out to. Cool. Makes sense. Okay. Jordan, what is a value driven question, an example perhaps, and then where we should be using them? I think for, for just about every product or service or salesperson, there's, um, there's a, a great overall question that you can ask somebody kind of in your initial, um, outreach, whether I have an inbound opportunity of somebody saying, hey, uh, I work as a roofer, you know, how could you sell, help me sell? Or I'm uh, reaching out to somebody in cellular sales. Um, I would always ask a question kind of along the lines of, hey, what's the one skill that you're looking to develop the most right now? Is it negotiating? Is it follow up? Is it uh, cold calling, setting an appointment, getting past a gatekeeper, so on and so forth? And then I'm able it's a value driven question because it shows one that I actually care <laughs> about your sales skills. I'm not just saying, oh, I'm going to help you sell better. Um, but it also is valuable to me because I'm getting that one valuable piece of information from somebody else on where I might be able to actually help them out. So for anybody listening, um, whether you sell medical devices or you sell cars or real estate, um, you might want to consider crafting up that little question of, hey, what's that that one thing or those two things that you know, I might be able to help you, you know, uh, accomplish working with you. Um, and I think that will give you a really good basis and a foundation on where to take the rest of your, your pitch and your interaction with that person. How deep do we need to go with this question of, are we looking for that immediate response of, for a roofer, I'm looking how to cold call, do cold outreach, or I'm looking how to progress the deal as in I send out lots of quotes, but nothing happens. Or are we looking for a level deeper than that? Are we looking to, when we ask a question like this, for them to go, huh, and think about it and then give you a solid answer? Are we looking for that, that huh moment? Or are we looking for the first thing that comes off the top of the head? Really, one of the things that, that I do well, at least in my niche, because it, it's, it's, it's what I do. But for everybody out there, when you do ask that question and, and a roofer says, uh, you know, cold calling, um, I have now the understanding that this person may have a problem with cold calling or they want to develop that skill. And I can ask them now a series of questions based on just that, that, like that one thing. So you can take this funnel really deep. And what you want to do 
is make it really deep. I want to find out, hey, how are you cold calling now? Uh, what's your favorite thing about the way that you're doing it right now? Do you have a process? Do you have a script? How's it working for you? Do you think it could be better? If you could change it, what would it be? And you can ask this series of questions where, again, if you genuinely care about the answer, uh, you should be able to pinpoint exactly what they can do differently and how I might be able to provide this roofer uh, with value. So is that the process? I know you just kind of glossed over that, but is it finding out what people do now, what they enjoy about it? I guess that puts a positive spin on the conversation rather than all being doom and gloom <laughs> if they're suffering with something. Then we suss out or get them, I guess, to tell them, tell us what they could be doing better. And then we explain how we could change that or improve that. Is that the basic structure of what this this call or email conversation should look like? At a, at a general level, I think that's something that just about everybody can duplicate. Um, and again, I think it's a really good format of, of asking some of these questions after you get the, the direction. You're just you're moving, moving your ship in the direction of where your, your prospect wants you to go. So we can treat this almost like a, a mini sales funnel on one call of we start off not doing much, we're narrowing it down, narrowing it down, narrowing it down. And where, where do we, how do we know when we've hit the nail on the head? How do we know when we've got that, that thing that is actually going to motivate them to close a deal, to get past whatever fear, whatever fear of missing out, whatever is hold, potentially going to hold them back in the future further down the sales cycle? How do we know when we've touched on that nerve? That's always a, can be a little tricky um, because other people are just different. And I, I've definitely had people that are very interested in me where I, I was unable to identify that they were really interested after my, <laughs> my series of questions. I've, I've made those mistakes. But typically, um, when I am right about somebody actually being interested after, you know, I ask a couple of questions, um, you usually hear a that's great or that's right or oh, wow, or some type of little two-word statement that somebody's actually listened to what you've said and you've now mentioned something. The way that I always want to make sure that I'm going in the right direction is just simply asking a question. So whenever I'm talking too much in my sales pitch or in my cold call or any part of that, like here, here in the States, I know that you guys don't have that whole American football thing all the time, but here in the States, you, you have the quarterback and, you know, he hikes the ball or whatever, and he has all these people coming after him. Here in the States, he'll get rid of the football and, and, and throw the football when he knows he's about to get sapped, as they call it here. And what they call that is they call that um, just a, a mental timer. He knows that he has three to four seconds to get rid of the ball. And as a salesperson, um, you have to develop some type of little mental timer uh, when you're talking to somebody to know that it is now time to hand the ball over to your prospect and let them talk. It's time to ask a question. So um, again, I know there's a, a lot of different people that listen to this podcast and my solution might not work perfectly for you, but at the end of everything that I say, I wanna be able to pop a question, whether it really has to do with my sales pitch or not. I want I want to get my prospect talking because that, that, gives, that gives me control. The person that's listening is in control. I've got a... I won't call people out on it because I know one of them listens to the show, but a reasonably sized company in Silicon Valley, I got introduced to at the uh, sales hacker event at the beginning of the year. I got used, to, I got introduced to their CEO. We did an advertising deal kind of uh, behind the scenes, not a sponsorship of the show, but a sponsorship of other content. And he w just seemed not interested in anything I was saying for the 10 minutes that we were chatting, just was not, just not bothered about me being in front of him. I was obviously then there's a balance between looking like you're desperate and trying hard and just having a conversation and being confident and he's a bit of a man's man so you don't want to look like you're sucking up to him um so so i did the same thing almost like brushed it off and he was like at the end of the conversation he was like just drop me an email and and give us a quick proposal over email and we'll see what we do so i sent him this email i hiked up the price because i wasn't that fussed about dealing with not necessarily him the team is awesome but i thought he's a you know he's going to be hard work to deal with and 10 minutes later, I got an email back saying, okay, fine. And he really, apparently really enjoyed the conversation, really enjoyed everything that we're doing. He's a massive fan of the show. He specific, and he'll be laughing, listen to this, hopefully in his car as he's driving to, driving to the office as he, as he kind of tunes in. But, and I told, cause I've told him this after the fact, uh, I use this as a, a conversation start the next time around when there was another opportunity to, to work with him. But it was one, my price obviously wasn't high enough in that he just came back immediately and said, yes. So that was one learning experience from it. But then two, it was, 
you have to i have to take responsibility for it or i couldn't read him um it wasn't you, know, you can put the responsibility on, uh, responsibility on him if it, and i feel that's a disempowering thing to do of clearly he was trying to be guarded be shielded he didn't want me chasing him after the fact he was going to make a decision and the decision was final and it was a favorable one in the end so he was putting on a, a bit of a front but I take responsibility of that, of I couldn't see through that. And I, my communication skills weren't good enough to, to work it out. So I just thought that was a kind of to paint a bit of a picture of what you were describing there. But coming back to that's great. I think of, I've had other people on the show before and they've said similar things. Are we should, should we be asking questions that lead to a that's great? Is that the, the positive kind of cycle of that's great, that's good, let's do it? Is that what we should be trying to build momentum with on a call? That's an awesome question. I feel that so many different uh, books and seminars and trainings and, and you get told as a salesperson by your sales manager to, to get your prospect like the bobblehead and just have their, you know, have them say yes as many times as possible. And um, I think that's a, that can be a little bit of a mistake because yes, um, yes gives you as a salesperson a lot of control um, where no uh, it allows you to start negotiating. Open it opens up other possibilities, and um, it also gives your prospect the illusion of control. So at any given time, you're talking to that CEO from the Silicon Valley about something, and you give them some type of price, and you're like, "Hey, you know, like when would you want to maybe get started? Would you start today?" Like, and he says, "No." That's a great answer. That's a good thing. I love when prospects tell me, no, I wouldn't want to do it that way. That allows me as a salesperson to back up, say, okay, here's the other options. Which one would you maybe consider if they made sense? And it also gives my prospect now that, that illusion of control where he's in the driver's seat. I just said no, because, um, do you guys have a like satellite or internet like radio in your cars over over there? Uh, yeah, we, we call it digital radio. It's not quite like serious, but it's some similar. Okay, like so. A brief story. I'm I'm on the phone yesterday. I got a, a cold call yesterday from Sirius XM. Um, I've bought like five new vehicles in the last six years, and I never ever keep Sirius because I just never really listen to it. But I had an inbound phone call from from this guy yesterday. He had an unbelievable attitude, was very, very excited to talk to me. Um, and I ended up being on the phone with this person for 18 minutes so that I could, you know, get a little experience on how uh, they operate. And um, this person never asked me one question about, hey, if there was a radio station that we could give you access to, what would it be? What was your favorite one while you had the trial? And there was a, a few mistakes, but all in all, they had a, a great attitude. And that's what I found valuable. So in some cases, um, just being energetic, just being enthusiastic, just being able to, you know, have a great attitude can sometimes be the value add. And, I, you know, I, I know I've made some money just having a great <laughs> attitude from times, and I'm sure you have as well. I've had people uh, more than once. So this isn't just one crazy person emailing me, but no, not crazy regularly, say once a month or so, a couple of, uh, kind of 10 times a year, I get an email saying, hey, I don't really get much from your show, but I find it really motivating that both you and the person that you're interviewing are obviously passionate about sales. And it gives me, it almost gives me the opportunity in my mind to believe that I can be passionate about it as well. Along An email along those lines of, you know, I've not got anything tactical from this whatsoever, but I still tune in just because it's good to hear that two people are passionate about it. And one, I'm thinking of one, I think his name is Peter, the last person to email me this a few weeks ago. And essentially, he's in a sales team. Um, he's selling food products. I'm not sure what, but he's selling food products to big supermarkets here in the UK. And his team, apparently all boring old dudes. They are all miserable. They're always complaining. It's a toxic environment to be in. And he's trying to you know, be excited and, and, and add value to his kind of audience by being excited about what he's doing. And he says he listened to a show before he goes on calls just to get that little rub off of enthusiasm, which was interesting to me. But going back to no for a second here, because I don't want to gloss over this, Jordan. Why is no powerful? So you said it's it's it gives the illusion that the person that you're speaking to has control. But is it also the fact that, or, or less the fact that they've got control, more the fact that they can go ah, and relax for a second? You, it's almost like taking the, the pressure off, taking your foot off the gas for a car metaphor and 
you you almost giving them a reset button to c control themselves so that then they can carry on the conversation. Is that about right, or is there anything else that is uh, worth going for the no? That's dead on, and I remember exactly why I started talking about SiriusXM is on that phone call, their whole their whole script on that phone call is to get me to say yes, yes, yes. And literally, as a human being, like you're feeling like you're getting backed into this yeah. corner, and it just, it's uncomfortable always saying yes, yes, yes. So, you know, if they, I, I believe that if they redesigned their phone call a little bit where they were like, where where they were able to generate a, an, an initial no that i pick up the phone i'm like no and i i feel like i'm in control i feel like yes i can take my feet off the gas now and um you know somebody else isn't just trying to back me into a corner um i feel you know like that's a really valuable skill is being able to answer or ask a question where your prospect can actually have the opportunity to say no um, because again it allows you to feel better about the whole situation. It allows you to feel like you're in control. And it also allows me to know that, look, there's other alternatives, there's other options uh, that we can now actually consider rather than just this one option. So I'm assuming that you're not saying we should immediately on the phone, ask for the business, get shot down, and then it's an awkward conversation after the fact. If that isn't the case, and it might be, tell me if I'm wrong, but if that isn't the case, how do we engineer a no into the conversation? How do we how do we make that happen without it then being weird afterwards? Basically, you may, um, for instance, uh, you're, you're talking about, again, this is all very general, um, for, for something that I'm doing. Rather than saying, hey, um, do you want to get better at, at sales? Okay, because that's what I help people do. Do you want to get better at sales? What's 100% of the people going to say? They're all, <laughs> yes. And they're immediately going to feel like, okay, what's he doing? Like, you know, what yeah. do I need to be on the lookout here or something? Um, but rather than, I would, I, I could simply ask somebody, are you uh, happy right now with your income? Are you hitting your goals? Are you hitting your quotas? Uh, those answers could be yes, and they could also be no, and it just it leaves open for an honest discussion. When somebody says, no, I'm not making the money that I want to. What's the alternative? either making less or making more than what they're what they're making. And so that opens the discussion of, hey, what are you currently doing now to make more money? Um, do you have, you know, these these tools or strategies available right now where you can actually do that? So, um, it, again, in, in what I do, th those are some of the questions that I would ask somebody, um, because, again, maybe not everybody wants to make more money. I don't say, do you want to make more money? Um, I can say, is the money that you have enough for you right now? And again, I can construct these these no questions. Why that is interesting to me, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but just to kind of highlight, highlight it for the audience, you are asking a question where the answer could be yes or no versus when you're going for that bobblehead effect, you're asking questions that you know down well the answer is yes to versus uh, what I thought you were going to say then, Jordan, was we would engineer the opposite of that where we know 100% it's no. But when we ask a question where we don't know the answer, we're genuinely doing discovery here we're, we're trying to genuinely suss out yes or no it's more of a genuine question it's less manipulative and it's all less less weird from for someone to answer i guess they can answer it more honestly right if they know that they can say you know kind of positively negative towards it here's something that's always bugged me um about myself as a salesperson and about other salespeople is we get tied up in our product and our service and our company and we know how good it is and we might be the best price and we get excited about what it is that we actually sell and we end up cold calling somebody, uh, showing up to a pitch, uh, whatever, and we, we do our, our best to, to make things happen and somebody shuts us down or says no or um, whatever. Um, there's, there's a lot of people on this planet. <laughs> there's a lot of prospects. There is a lot of business and um, I think that people get caught up in the fact that, oh my gosh, I can't believe that this person didn't do it with me or schedule an appointment with me or whatever. At the end of the day, people do have the <laughs> the right to not be interested. And I have to accept responsibility as a salesperson for the fact that dude, when I call Will Barron and Will Barron says, hey, look, <laughs> I'm just not interested. After asking that yes or no question, I'm going to ask you an honest question. I'm going to be genuine towards you. And if you genuinely do not care about my product or service or about me, I'll call the next guy. And I think that that's one of the things that salespeople kind of miss out on is, is they finally get Will on the phone and they, 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 you don't, you're not interested maybe in, in something at that time. 
Um, I have to know as a salesperson to call you on down the road and accept the responsibility for the fact that you're not interested right now. We'll wrap up with this, Jordan. And having said that, this could be a four-hour conversation in itself. So I'm, I'm aware of that. How much of this is, how much of adding value through our emails, our cold calls, our initial communications, our networking, event meetups, whatever we're doing, how much of this is technique and scripts versus having a mindset which allows us to not be hounding people because we have an abundance mindset. We know that there's plenty more business in the in the sea to, to go after. How much of this is mindset of you can add value by just being happy, motivated, and excited on the phone and that obviously rubs off on people and there's, there's true value to have there if someone's having a shit day and you have a really nice conversation with them, even if they don't buy from you, you're in a good light of potentially getting business in the future. So how much of this is down to technique and how much of it is down to the mindset element of all of you know sales and just business in general? The whole providing value thing is is the way that you get to the close. People say ABC, 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 always be closing. You can't close without value. If you don't see value in me, there's there's no price high or low that I'm going to be able to sell you a product on. So um, for those listening, um, one of the things that I've done extremely well is being able to provide value up front in the process. This could be on a cold call just saying, hey, look, um, I'm never going to call you again, but I want your email address. I'm going to shoot you one PDF or one document or you know one thing. It takes two and a half minutes to look at. You can give me a yay or nay, and either way, I'm going to be fine. And that's a piece of value. You can uh, throw somebody a free ebook. You can, in my business, I call business owners and I say, "Hey, can I just run a free sales meeting for your your team? Can I get them pumped up for free? You'll you'll ne- I'll never call you again unless you unless you want me to. These are the things that you have to do today. Uh, reaching out in into somebody's DM. Can I provide you with something? Hey, I thought. This was really cool. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that and and gain altitude in that phone call by dropping a statistic or a a recent case study or providing somebody with something that they don't have right now makes what you have valuable. And when you can provide that value, then you can start asking for things in return. I'm going to ask you again a crazy question here that is is a whole podcast in itself. For someone who's listening to this show, they are, Sam the salesperson is selling SaaS accounting software. No, selling marketing software. Because I know there's a bunch of marketing salespeople, uh, SaaS software that listen to this show from Silicon Valley to, to over here and everywhere else. What do you, what do they do if they are, even if they're an SDR, they're just cold calling, they're making meetings all day. Uh, they're cold emailing all day. What, what do they do? What's the first step when they don't have that insight, that piece of value? Where do they uncover these nuggets of information that makes the, because that's the game changer. That changes the conversation from, hey, I need to book a meeting to hit my target to, hey, here's a bit of information and insight, which is going to lead you to want to talk to us. Where, and I'm, I'm trying to oversimplify things here, but where do they get these insights from? The best resource for, for information for me, and again, this, 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 this content that you are sending out or providing as value doesn't have to be like, <laughs> mind blowing. Um, it, it could it could simply just be a statistic. Um, it could be um, in, in in maybe the case for the marketing guy out in Silicon Valley right now that doesn't know exactly where to find this piece of content. Um, and he's just making cold calls. He is the value add. Um, there's a good chance that you know with other businesses that he's calling on that those people don't have a great uh, relationship or connection with the salesperson from which they're doing business with. So if, if there is no value add, you are the value add and simply being able to provide somebody with you and your, if you genuinely care. And, and again, I, I feel like the whole value thing and at, at the bottom line of what we're talking about today is, are you a genuine salesperson? If you want to be great at sales, can you just be genuine? I, I can guarantee your success. If you are genuine about what it is that you're actually doing and the services that you provide, I think that you can be successful simply just being genuine. When you do, like you mentioned earlier, build strategies and you do have a little bit of a script and you do have a little bit of a process that you can actually follow and duplicate, then I can absolutely guarantee your success as a salesperson. But it, it boils down to, hey, can I can I bring you some value? I wouldn't expect you to do business or talk to me if I can't. Love it. And I, just for context on this, 
and I, I think I've talked about this on the show before, but not from maybe this angle, that in medical device sales, I was always kind of a, a BC player, always hitting target, but not really crushing it. And I'd look up to one or two people in the team. In hindsight, they probably weren't the best people to be looking up to as, as individuals, but business-wise, they, they were crushing it. They were super aggressive and they were doing really well. I did not really give a shit about selling those products before I left the company. Just the kind of six, final six months, had a new sales manager. We didn't really get on. He was asking me for all kinds of paperwork constantly. He was just a pain in my ass. And I think he was kind of pushing some of his work on, onto me, knowing that he was, he was new and he could probably get away with it. Versus now, when I sell the ad space, the kind of the business deals that we do with the newsletter and everything else, I really, really do care. And that comes across that rubbers crossing people. And even just as I'm saying it now, I can feel myself speeding. <laughs> I need I need to slow down and I have to put more breaths in when I'm on the phone with people because they, they can't understand my British accent in the first place. And then when I'm rabbiting on at 400 mile an hour, they can, can't understand the, the, the sales pitch that I'm going through. And that is night and day. That is the difference between me closing. You know, there's multiple six figure deals that we've closed in the past few months alone. And that was the difference between that and the, the million dollar deals that I was doing in the medical device world was I'd go in, you know, medium energy. It was just average. It, it would only take someone who is that 1% better than average, 1% more excited than average, could have took all that business away from me. And that's, I think, is a sad place to be when you're not excelling because you're not, you know, in your best self. And it's, it's down to you and it's not the product and it's your it's your fault. That kind of is a, is a downward spiral. And I, I just encourage the audience to, if they're not passionate about what they're selling, and you don't have to, you know, obviously I run my own business, so it's slightly different. And you're same, same with yourself, Jordan, what you're doing now. You're always going to be more passionate about your own business than anyone else's and the own products that you're creating. So I'm not saying everyone needs to go and become an entrepreneur to have this passion. But if you're really, you know, down in the dumps, if you don't really like going to the office, if you don't really like your customers, then you're almost shooting yourself in the foot before you even get started and putting yourself at a disadvantage. But with, with that rant out of the way, Jordan, I've got one final question, mate, that I ask everyone that comes on the show. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? Get answers and actually try um, a lot sooner. Um, I, I, I flew by the seat of my pants as a salesperson going door to door for way too long and was basically crossing my fingers, wishing, hoping, and praying that, hey, this guy's going to buy from me. And um, just being able to take responsibility over the fact that, hey, you know, when somebody does business with me, it's because I wanted them to do business with me and I made it happen rather than uh, I just got lucky. Was that a realization that happened in an instance of I have to take responsibility for everything that I'm doing? But, you know, this goes across sales, life, relationships, family, and everything else. Or was this something that you learned gradually over time? Um, it hit me like a ton of bricks when I was in New York City. Um, I was on my first phone's uh, job and um, it was my first realization that, okay, I have these numbers of, of dials and, and stuff like that are expected of me and I have certain results that are expected of me. And so, um, it, 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 it like dawned on me. I'm like, Hey, you know, I actually, if I'm going to make a hundred phone calls, I'm expected to do whatever 15 or 20 sales. Um, it should be up to me to get 30 or 35 or to prove that I can be better than somebody else or be the top person or whatever. And so, uh, that's when it really dawned on me that, you know, I, there's probably somebody out there that's better than me. <laughs> there's probably somebody that's making more money than me. And there's probably resources available where I can I can start duplicating what they do, uh, where I can get better results. And, and that's something that I wish I would have started when I was, you know, 16 and 17 years old selling vacuum cleaners. <laughs> I wish I would discovered the same thing at 16, 17, because uh, out of sales and, and anything else that I was doing at the time, I would have been so less stressy about everything, knowing that if you if you win, you succeed, great, you earned it, you did it. Or if you didn't succeed, it's your fault and you can improve and progress. Whereas what I used to do as a kid, and I, I guess part of this is just growing up and becoming a man and becoming an adult as well, Of I would put responsibility on other people, I would blame other people, I would tell white lies of why I didn't achieve things, I would twist the truth, I would spin it, and... I think everyone's probably done this and I think it is a, an adult, a child to adult kind of progression. But the more I take responsibility for just everything in my life right now, the less stressed I am about it, the more, the irony is the more control I feel I've got over everything and success or non-success, because clearly you've got to have ups and downs or you're not pushing yourself hard enough. 
it's just a better position to be in in both sales and everything else so i appreciate that jordan and with that mate for everyone who's enjoyed this conversation tell us where we can find out more about you and then tell us a little bit about the newsletter as well because i know there's a load of value in there for the audience Absolutely. So again, uh, my name is Jordan Stupar. You guys can find me all over social. Um, my handle on just about everything is Jordan Stupar, S-T-U-P-A-R, if you're listening. Um, and most importantly, if you found any value in this podcast or you were kind of vibing out to anything that we were talking about, I have an absolutely free, no obligation, a way to provide value to you um, by going to jordanstupar.com and uh, simply scroll down to the bottom there of the site put in your email address and I'll be happy to uh, stay in contact with you and uh, hopefully provide you with some value. Good stuff. Well, I'll link to all of that in the show notes to this episode over at salesmanpodcast.com. And with that, Jordan, I want to thank you for your time, your insights. I want to thank you for, we're going to kind of like deep at the end there. So I appreciate that. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Awesome. I really appreciate the opportunity, Will, and, and hopefully we can do it again. 